This is a story about mothers, about poverty. Do you mind me asking how much you get paid an hour? $3.13. And about how big breakthroughs in neuroscience could be a critical missing link in the war on poverty. Hey! A major shift is taking place. A shift that is radically changing prenatal care for some poor moms, with a potentially big impact on intergenerational poverty. The right kinds of supports during pregnancy are ultimately the earliest intervention for increasing the likelihood that that next generation will do better. New science bringing new hope more than 50 years after the war on poverty began. How profound of a shift is it to see neurobiology used as a tool in the war on poverty? Oh, it's just transformation. It's nothing less than transformational. I think it's pretty well accepted that when a woman is pregnant, alcohol, smoking, drugs, exposure to lead, things like that are toxic to her developing fetus. Yep. Is poverty in a way the toxin? Well, poverty is toxic, yes. But poverty is not equal to toxic stress. Toxic stress is not about the cause of the stress. It's the biological response to the stress. When we are stressed, our heart rate goes up, our blood pressure goes up. Stress hormones get released in our bloodstream. Toxic stress is when those systems are activated most of the time. People who are living in poverty are at much greater risk to experience toxic stress because the causes of stress in their daily lives don't go away easily. The stress of a hell of a roof over your head, the stress of food, the stress of having bills to pay, all of those things. The stress of not being able to get out of that hole. And an environment that is fraught with stresses affects gene expression. It affects how some genes turn on or turn off. In utero? And from the moment of conception until the moment you die. My journey begins in Wheeling, West Virginia, just a few weeks before President Trump visited the state and declared the economy booming. Hello, West Virginia. What a great song. And by the way, your state is booming like never before. Poverty is plummeting. Our stock market is soaring, which I view as jobs, jobs, jobs. All time high. In West Virginia, women face higher poverty rates than men. Hey, baby Joe. Hey. Hey, how are you? I'm doing well, how are you? Stephanie. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. I'm here to understand how the stress of poverty can affect a mom, her child, and even her unborn baby. I'm looking at like the markets and economic boom times for a lot of people in this country right now. Are you feeling that here in West no, Virginia or in Wheeling? No, I'm not. Amy Jo Hutchinson is a community organizer that works with poor moms to help them navigate the system. Why did you decide specifically to deal with single moms? I'm a single mom. I'm born and raised in West Virginia. I'm 46 years old. I've never really spent a day in my life not in poverty. Your so mom was a single mom? My mom was a single mom. My dad uh, passed away when I was six years old. What are some of like the unique challenges that you see moms you're working with facing? I believe when you're oppressed in a, in a marginalized class that you're generally made to feel that what you have to say doesn't matter. Like, people are writing laws that affect us every day. Let's go take a ride and check out. Yeah, you want to go see what yeah. it's about around here? Yeah. Okay, let's go. This is our downtown area. This is East Wheeling. And this is our library here on the left. Um, the soup kitchen is right across the street here from the library. How big does the poverty issue loom? in this area. If you're talking West Virginia and you stick your hands out, you're going to touch somebody who's poor. We hear a lot around here about pulling yourself up by the bootstraps and how people need a hand up, not a hand out. But we don't have the policies in place as a nation for that to happen. Yeah. You know, um, we can't. How are you going to pull yourself up by the bootstraps when you don't have public transportation to even go and buy a pair of boots? 
There are a patchwork of organizations in Wheeling that help moms make ends meet. Many of them are in churches. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring worries of its own. Hi. What would these people do if there weren't churches like yours? I don't know. We have some people that come through and this is their main source of food. Three breads, three sweets. Okay. I know a lot of times the parents do without food to feed their kids, and that's hard to see. It's here that I met Kristen and got a true understanding of what the stress of poverty can do to a mother and to her children. I'm filling the bag and I will be over to get you. I'm in Will, so I'll be right over. This is my daughter, Skylar, one of three. I have a 10-year-old and a 13-year-old. I got pregnant at 16. My mother and father were both addicts and alcoholics, and I had a rough childhood. I dropped out of school. I had my daughter in jail, shackled and chained to a hospital bed with no family there with me. She won't talk to new people. Okay, this is him. Hello? I'm at, I'm at a church thing. So clearly you're still struggling financially. Trying to get away from an abusive guy. If you don't believe me, you can talk. Am I, am I at a church right now? Yes, she is. He's a great father, not so much a great boyfriend. We've been together seven years, and he's very controlling. Enough. Oh, you're getting a call. Who's calling you? Can I get two of these, one for me and one for him? Can you just tell us a little bit about the stresses you were going through? I mean, obviously you were I was going on through... Subutex when I was pregnant with her. What is that? That's for... To get off opiates. Oh, yeah. This is her dad calling, okay. so... I'm really sorry, but, you know, I've got to go pick him up from work. Okay. But she had had withdrawals, and I went through postpartum depression. Um, I was alone. I didn't have any support. My mom lives in Tennessee. I don't have a lot of family. Mm -hmm. And my mom wasn't the greatest mom, so I strive to be what she wasn't. have all of these systemic barriers and society pushing you down and telling you that, you know, you're never going to get ahead and you're not, you're not worthy of anyone wanting to give you a hand up, right? Yeah. But your point is people turn to the escape potentially of drugs because they're not happy, because they're poor. I think so. Poverty has to be discussed when it comes to this drug epidemic. And I think that if we would start this at a young level and really focus on coping skills. What coping skill can I teach you to equip you to deal with that? You know, to where it's not catastrophic. Yeah. It just doesn't have to be catastrophic all the time. Brain development begins early in pregnancy um, in a very primitive way. And by the time you're born, your brain, the brain of a newborn has most, not all, but most of the billions and billions of cells, neurons, that a mature brain has. If the stress systems in the womb, in the fetus, are activated a lot of the time as a result of the stresses in the, in the pregnant woman's life, the message to these systems is, it's a dangerous world out there. So you gotta be on a hair trigger because at any given moment, something bad's gonna happen and you've gotta activate, get the blood pressure up, get the stress systems activated. It sounds like in some ways the fetal stress system is mirroring the mother's. Abs absolutely, well, it's, it's being influenced by, yes, it's mirroring the mother's. Today I'm visiting Jenny, a single mom working full time and living in subsidized housing. Even with a steady income, Jenny is constantly struggling to make ends meet. <laughs> Say, come on you in. You must be Carter. Well, welcome. Thank you. It's nice <laughs> to meet you. How are you feeling? Pregnant. <laughs> We're good. Me too. Very hot. Let's just give him a tour. 
This is the baby's room and toys on the floor. Wow, you're already all set up. So this is the crazy room. He's in bed. I think a lot of people might see Carter's got plenty of toys. Here, come on. Of course. Be careful. Got your own house, like you're doing all right. Don't judge a book by its cover, because <laughs> it can look great on the outside, but there's a lot of struggles. I live paycheck by paycheck. I don't have a bank account. I don't have any money saved. This was a yard sale find. I love this Oh, truck. wow. Hey. Are you gonna show us how to get to the park? We'll follow you. Okay. I guess you can't give us a ride. Don't go too fast. <laughs> Not all West Virginians are these hillbillies with no teeth and living off of the government. We actually work our butts off. I'm a strong woman. I love my kids more than anything in this world. And I'll do anything to, to stay strong. Are you in the clouds yet? What was it like when you were pregnant with Carter? Tell me, was it planned? Did you expect it? It was not planned at all. I'm a recovering addict. I was living in a treatment center. I didn't have a job, so I didn't have any money. Um, me and his father would go every day at 11 o'clock to the soup kitchen and eat lunch every day together. Um, actually, our first date was a soup kitchen date. <laughs> it's kind of embarrassing, but it's the truth. Um, I get to, he was also in a treatment center too. It's kind of how we met. Okay. So once you had the, the baby, everything went smoothly? The pregnancy was pretty smooth? So I relapsed while I was pregnant with Carter. Okay. Um, and I landed myself in jail a week after I relapsed. That was a low point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know if it was God, me, I don't, or him. Something just clicked and it was like, okay. And now you have another one on the way. I do. And how different <laughs> is being pregnant this time versus when you were struggling and you were pregnant with Carter? It's a lot different um, because I get to enjoy it. I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm stressed, but I'm not so stressed where I was with him, you know, to the point where I just didn't even think about being pregnant. I've never known Jenny not to work. I feel like she is the perfect picture of doing everything that you're supposed to have to do and she's she uh, doesn't give up right I mean she's like puts her head down and she just keeps on moving forward what the new biological understanding of all these things going on in pregnancy tells us is that actually um, providing the right kinds of supports during pregnancy are ultimately the earliest intervention for the Whoever's going to be born from that pregnancy, who someday will be a parent himself or herself, we're, we're already increasing the likelihood that that next generation will do better. So you're due December, December 5th, which is the same exact day that I'm due. <laughs> Congratulations. You've been homeless recently? Um, it was in February and March. Okay. <laughs> okay. And how old are you? I'm 18. How have you been doing as far as the stress of pregnancy? You know, I've had a lot of depression a lot. So me and the, the dad kind of, he's happy about it. He says he's going to be there. I'm, I'm worried that he's not going to be there. I'm sorry. That's okay. <laughs> Why are you crying right now? Um, I, I mean, I'm, it's because I'm happy and depressed at the same time. But I'm depressed because he's not, I don't know if he's going to be there. Yeah. Did you think you would be doing it on your own? No. Yeah. I mean, I know my mom did it on her own when she was pregnant with me, but it's kind of scary because I don't want it, my baby to have life like that. I'm sorry. That's okay. Because um, my dad wasn't there when I was born. And basically that's all I know. 
What is the next, like, I don't know if you've been able to think out this far, but what are the next, like, two years you think look like in your life? Um, I don't know. What would you want to happen? I just hope he's happy. I just met this young mom, this teenage mom, who, you know, she was like in a really bad situation. When I asked her what her hopes were or what her plans were, she just said, I don't know. It's really hard to think about tomorrow when you don't know how you're going to get through the next hour, you know? Especially when you're talking about deep poverty, it's just a survival mode. And so um, as far as having dreams and aspirations, how do you do that? You know, how do you look 10 years into your future when you really don't know where you're going to be living at the end of this week? When you are in the kind of stresses that come from not knowing where you're going to be living or where your next meal is coming from, the severity of the stress can cause us to actually shut down uh, certain aspects of the brain. On average, uh, kids who were growing up in poverty had 6% smaller brain surface area than children whose families earned $150,000 a year or more. At Columbia University, neuroscientist Kimberly Noble, along with colleagues, is testing how income and poverty affect the size of a child's brain. We know that when kids grow up in poverty, their brain looks different across a host of variables. So both their brain structure, or how it looks, as well as their brain function, or how it works, seems to uh, be different. We know that the brain is incredibly plastic in childhood. Um, and so we have every reason to believe that by uh, providing warm and nurturing relationships, that children's brain trajectories can change for the better. As you get older, you can always make things better. But if you're working on a foundation that was weakened because of toxic stress early in life, it's harder to kind of build better skills on top of that. Not impossible, but harder. It takes more work. It takes more intensive coaching. It takes more practice. And it never will be as strong as it would have been if you had built a stronger foundation. We have studied resilience in the face of poverty. There's one feature that comes out from every one of those studies, which is one of the most important predictors of good outcomes in the face of adversity, is the presence of at least one reliable, responsive, protective relationship with an important person. It can be a, can very often as a parent, it can be a, another family member, a grandparent, and literally that protective relationship is having an effect at the epigenetic level that is influencing how the genes turn on and turn off to kind of produce healthier outcome, better, more adaptive behavior. We are biologically wired to be responsive to supportive relationships when we're young. And if we don't have them, our stress system goes bonkers. These new understandings of the biology of poverty could change how nonprofits, government, policymakers, and even prenatal care practitioners go about breaking the cycle of poverty. How might programs be more effective to protect the developing pregnancy, to protect the health of the mother and the baby who will be born at the end of that pregnancy, rather than just the traditional old prenatal care of come in and get weighed, check your blood pressure, check your urine, make sure you don't have diabetes, and say, I'll see you next month. 21st century science is taking us far beyond that content of what prenatal care should be all about. That's the excitement of this new knowledge. What's been wonderful is that there's just been this explosion of studies and there's been a convergence of behavioral sciences, social sciences, and pure sciences coming at this, this study from different perspectives, but saying the same things. So the information is, is powerful and it's cascading in a way that you can barely stay on top of it. But can you coach an unborn baby out of poverty? One program is trying to do just that. Mm -hmm. 
Lori Rogers is a trained nurse who works with low-income, first-time mothers and their babies through a nonprofit called Nurse Family Partnership. One of the things about Nurse Family Partnership is to make sure that, hey, we're asking, what, what do you want to do in your life? Where, what, what's important to you? She begins working with moms in their third trimester, before the baby is even born. She coaches them to set goals, reduce stress, and get healthy. The program trains nurses across the country in 41 states and has been doing it for decades. Hello. Hey there. All right. Let's go. Let's do it. I'll have three visits today, one in the morning, one around midday, and one about mid-afternoon. And this is the famous Martin Luther King. Um, oh, I recognize that church. church. So obviously Montgomery is a huge center of Martin Luther King's civil rights movement. One of the reasons we first started looking into poverty around the country is the 60th anniversary of the Poor People's Campaign that Dr. King launched. And the, the poverty rate really hasn't shifted much in, in the country since that time. When you drive through a place like this, you kind of feel like his dream wasn't really realized. Okay, we are headed out to Latrita's house. She is a 24-year-old mom. Her daughter is around 18 months. Hey! Good morning! Good morning! <laughs> We're gonna sit over here? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Look at this butterfly. <laughs> Typically, our visit consists of asking how they've been since we've been last year, whether they've been healthy or I try to weigh Aubrey. I might get some measurements on her. We typically talk about Latrita, how's her job going? Well, this is this is an updated job list. Thought I'd give you this and just see. There might be something there. Then we, we've got some things that she has asked for information on, such as potty training, because Aubrey okay. is starting to show some signs, some yeah. interest in, in potty training. It's really trying to get her to stop taking off that pamper at night. This is a potty book. Look. Look at the bunny. Ooh. That could be you sitting on the potty. Oh. Who's yeah. that? Is that Aubrey? Who is that? She's in a stable relationship at this point. However, they have yet to find stable housing. So that's one of her goals. Her 18 month old is actually her third pregnancy. Her first two um, pregnancies ended with the demise of the baby due to preeclampsia. Dealing with that while working part time and trying to find housing. So there was a lot of stress with that. Can I have a kiss, kiss? Mm -hmm. How does Nurse Family Partnerships Protocol address that emerging research that says when the baby is in utero, their outcomes may already start to be determined at that very, very early stage? If the mother is living in a stressful environment during pregnancy, cortisol levels are affecting the, bra the baby's brain development. So that's where we come in during that pregnancy. How can we help her with that environment? How can we help her with the stressors of the pregnancy, stressors of relationships? So the, the whole point is to just try to see what we can do to bring this environment to a safer, more calm place for this mom to even to develop her baby. With this last pregnancy, she did follow a medical advice. And when she was feeling stressed, we talked about um, stressors and how she could kind of overcome those or deal with those in a better way. And there are moms that didn't agree to go in front of the camera that I imagine have things much worse. Yes. They may not have felt like they were meeting some of the goals that they, they wanted to meet. Some of them are in, in very dire straits. What do you do? Um, I work at Sonic Drive-In. I'm okay. a car hop there, but I want better. And what do you want? I want to be able to, you know, spend time with Aubrey and just uh, possibly a little more pay mm -hmm. for her. Percentage-wise of your day, how much time are you spent thinking about Aubrey and worrying about finances? Mm -hmm. I say 90%. 90% of the time. 90% of the time. Do you mind me asking how much you get paid an hour? 313. 
three dollars and thirteen cents. I'm a car. Okay, but you get so you get tips. I assume. I get tips. Okay. How much do you think having a nurse come to your home and sort of guide you through a lot of this has contributed to Aubrey's, you know, clearly healthy, you know, toddlerhood at this point? She's Honestly, getting a year and a half almost. Honestly, I wouldn't have thought I would have made it if it wasn't for Nurse Lauren. Because <laughs> yeah. it's so new to me. The new piece of science, goal setting, changes executive function. It's this idea that if we ask the right questions and get somebody to start setting goals based on what they actually feel they need in life, we're actually altering the way they think. Yeah, it all goes back to, if you want, neurochemistry and neurobiology. Our evidence indicates that with our kind of intervention, we can reduce families' use of Medicaid, reduce families' use of food stamps. The cost of the nurse-family partnership is, is recouped on a relatively short timeline by fewer premature deliveries, less use of the emergency room in the first year of life, and less hospitalization. So you could, for the cost of providing really high quality prenatal care for everyone in poverty, society would get that money back in two or three years in savings for health care costs. Everything after that is gravy, so that's, that's easy. But the fact is that the things that come after that, which you've already paid for anyway, are even bigger savings, right? They're the costs of incarceration later, they're the costs of, of chronic unemployment, they're the costs of even more expensive diseases in the population. When I was pregnant with him, my emotions went like, mixed emotion, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. At the time, I didn't have no nurse, I didn't have no Medicaid, I didn't have none of that. So you didn't I needed- have insurance? No, I needed help. This is your tummy time blanket. So you can have something, mama, mm -hmm. to lay him on because it's real important for him to have that time. Now, Brianna's a 20-year-old mom, and when I first met her, the only thing in her apartment was a mattress. Since then, she's been able to get a few more pieces of furniture, a couch. She's gotten, uh, you know, a swing for the baby. Look how good he's picking his head up. Yeah. Everything I do now, I think about him. I try to make the best decision for him. It's not for me now. It's a us. It's not a I anymore. Hey, baby. You know, see, he's, even got, he's even looking at some of these prints now. You can see me. You like it. Yeah. You like it? Good. So you love your blankie? You, you gonna hold your head up again? <laughs> you gonna give up now? Oh, oh, a little higher. Look at that. Little, ah! Very good, yay. <laughs> she's just taken on a second job at another fast food restaurant, and she's gonna be working with both of those to provide even more money. It's been a goal for her. I just got this new job. You did? Yeah. Where? Um, Chick-fil-A, East Chase. Really? Yeah. I know. Girl, I'm on it, girl. Yeah. I was so happy when I found out. I was like, Oh man. And you be the first one to kind of pop in my head. I'm like, I got to tell her. I got to tell her. I said, I got to tell her. Well, I'm proud of you. I know that that's one of the things that you wanted to do. So. It wasn't even just she was here as a nurse. She was here like a mom, like a second mom. So everything she ever told me, everything she ever gave, even a little care made me feel like I was loved by many. If you love, if you so loved by that one person, it, it may not even be just your mom, it might not just be your baby. And just for an outside person to not even know you for about two years, to come and love you like their own, that makes a big impact. Even if you are born into a situation where maybe your brain has been wired differently because you've been exposed to these poverty stressors, there's hope that that is not the end of the story. Oh no, it's absolutely not the end of the story. And I think that's the gift that the science provides us. Because it says very, very clearly that our past is not prologue. That we can change our, the, the destiny that might have been mapped out for us. <laughs> Jack Shonkoff and David Olds have known each other for 40 years. While they haven't collaborated academically, they have a similar viewpoint on how this breakthrough science can help women and children living in poverty. One of the things I wanted to say, Stephanie, is yeah. that 
One of the great joys, for me at least, of doing this kind of work is to be able to connect with guys, people, not guys, people like Jack. <laughs> yes. Who have, where we have a deep shared kind of, we have deeply shared sensibilities about what's important in life mm -hmm. and how to, how to get from here to there. Our personal connection, for me, means a great deal. A lot of the research into genes turning off and on based on toxic stress is relatively new. How does the work you're doing here at Harvard sort of reinforce or validate right. um, what David has been doing all along? Right, so from my perspective, it opens up the black box of, of beginning to explain, so what is it about the Nurse Family Partnership that's produced these positive effects? We can understand this at a deeper scientific level now. It occurred to me that as I was following the nurse and her visits with these women that were in really, really tough circumstances, that actually what she was doing was loving them. Yep. That she was introducing love in their lives. Yep. I mean, how's that for hard science? One of the active ingredients of effective promotion of health and prevention of, of problems from adversity is supportive, responsive relationships that are there and that are stable and that are individualized. And um, you know, you can't you can't do that without love. I love you. You love mama. I love you. I love you. So when you were talking about supportive relationships, another way of saying that is introducing love into people's lives can actually start to change things in the way they think. Right. Who was that person for you, Amy Jo, that made you feel cared for and loved and like you were strong enough to do it? If that's the- My mom was the first. I've just always seemed to have at least one person in my life. At the end of the day, that's, um, this is probably, I'm probably <laughs> looking at my ulterior head. Um, I think as human beings, we're called to do that. All we need to do is be someone's one person, right? That's not that hard. Hello, 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 hello. 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 Look like you're melting. And so when these people walk through the door, what do you want them to feel? Love, just love. The food is the, is the minor thing in, in this whole, whole thing. The food is getting people to get together with people that care about them. That's, that's our goal. The real process of helping people move out of poverty is the process of standing beside and helping them see themselves and their future in a different way. The goal here it's to take the weight off their necks, the weight of, a, of adversity and poverty and racism and violence, and give children a chance to flourish.